This is week three of the neural aesthetic, and uh, I think we're finding a flow, right? How many people played a little bit with ML5 this past week? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Um, we're going to do a few more demos of ML5, and then I'll also show you some other tools later today. So basically, the idea of this class today is the, I'm going to do a lecture on something which may at first appear useless to you, but is actually um, is actually secretly the most important thing that you'll learn in this class, which is how neural networks are actually trained. Um, you know, instead of just looking at it as we did last week as a magic trick. And this is the most theoretical thing we'll learn in this class. Um, we're, we're dealing with a lot of you know, black boxes that train neural networks, but it does really help a lot to know how, you know, a little bit more about the math for a couple of reasons. One is that, um, well, we're not just trying to learn how to do things, we're also trying to learn how to understand them. And um, it's really, really kind of enlightening to see that this stuff actually has a basis that you can understand, you know, like a theoretical basis to them. And also, it's, um, going to be helpful because occasionally you might run you might run into issues you might run into issues training neural networks or or setting them up to be trained and then having a little bit of insight into the training process will help you kind of debug those you know should should problems kind of come up and um, that will be the first half of today roughly and then the second half of today we'll get back to demos and I will um, I think there, there might be one or two loose things with ML5. We mostly covered some of the ML5, some of the basics of ML5 that I wanted to show you last week. Uh, but there's a couple more things that I think we'll also show. And then we'll also introduce Runway today. Um, we ran out of time before being able to do that last week. And um, depending on time, we may also get into ml 3 ofx which is the Open Frameworks demos. Um, those will probably be a little bit more next week, but, um, but possibly we'll begin them this week. So this is a picture by MC Escher of what appears to be an infinite staircase. Lots of you have seen this before, I'm sure. It's a very famous image. And um, this is kind of what this class is gonna feel like. Um, because, well, um, it's more of a, well, yeah, I mean, it's actually more of a metaphorical um, commentary, let's call it, on on the process of, of training. Because uh, basically a lot of stuff in machine learning, in particular the training process, is iterative. It feels like we're kind of walking up, or rather walking down a, a staircase um, and just trying to get to the bottom of it, but we never do. Um, and so this is kind of like a nice, nice metaphor for the training process. Okay, so um, let's recall, like the from a top level perspective, what um, you know, and I, I showed this before last week. I'll just make sure I'm recording. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, from a high level perspective, um, machine learning works kind of like this, right? You have some function, or at least supervised learning, you have some function that you're trying to learn, which maps some kind of input data x to some kind of output data y. So for example, image classification. X is a picture, Y is a label. And then um, F is learned, we call this learning, by uh, taking a training data set and then uh, applying a, machine, a learning algorithm on top of it in order to fine tune F. And um, for, so in the beginning, we kind of approach this like, you know, this is a magical wizard, something that basically, makes F work for us, right? Um, and so that was kind of where we left off last week, you know, with this magic wizard. Um, okay. okay. Um, yeah, so I really love that, that icon. Um, so, but now we're actually going to uh, have a, like more of a in-depth, you know, look more in depth about how this actually works. Now, just as a reminder to make things concrete, imagine image classification. This is all review from last week. You have some image, which is a series of pixels. So we take that as an input value, as an input vector to a neural network. Um, and then that neural network is characterized by neurons. And each of those neurons are basically a linear function 
of the um, inputs that are going into it projected through a nonlinearity, like most commonly these ReLU functions, rectified linear units, um, which is basically just a max operation. And then all of these are sort of cascaded together into a big neural network. Um, they're all composited together. And then the neural network has a series of output neurons, which is the number, in the case of classification, it would be the number of classes that you have. So for example, with digits, there's 10 of them going from zero to nine. And um, in the case of regression, there'd be one neuron, which is a continuous value. And um, then we would train it. And then in the training process, we saw, before we getting into how training actually works, we saw that something that happens during training is that the weights are iteratively learned there are iteratively kind of optimized in order to increase accuracy so and then the weights actually uh, are responsible for finding features so these are actually we're looking at our visualization of the features that this one layer neural network found in being trained on digits um, so we, we talked about different ways of visualizing this we said that if we had a two layer neural network, you would see something like this, where now in the first layer, the, it, it, the network is not, is no longer forced to learn each digit category by, you know, in one sort of layer. If it has two layers, it can learn more, more abstract features, more basic features, let's say, in the first layer. So things like loops and lines and, you know, dark patches, things like that. And then it can combine those um, into, it can combine them um, into, um, uh, into getting a, a better uh, approx, like you can combine the different first layer features into a second layer kind of weighted average of them. You know, and that's one way of looking at each of the digits. So a six is a loop plus a line, something like that. Um, and uh, then we introduced kind of quickly, but we introduced the notion of convolutional layers. So these are especially important in computer vision, but really they're important in any kind of data that where, um, you know, points have some sort of a spatial, uh, like this, the way that they're arranged spatially is relevant. So that's actually not just images, but also sound, you know, sound can also be thought of that way. Um, I mean, pretty much everything has spatial relevance. And so convolution is kind of looking at small scale features um, all along the plane and then basically those become your activations and then those are combined later later with with new features that look at those you know combine those features together basically yeah so then just occurred to me so in regression our last two neurons is just a single neuron and you take its weight mm -hmm. and that's our value and then in classification we're pick, we pick we pick it's still the case that every neuron in the last layer gets like the value from zero to one, but then we just pick the highest one, right? And that's mm -hmm. what we think Yeah. What do we do if we get a tie? A tie? A tie, like there's 20%, it has 20% confidence that it's a one, and also 20% confidence that it's a seven. Well, it's up to you to decide. You know, your application is gonna, first of all, you'll, you, uh, remember that these these are like floating point values, so the probability of getting an, a, an exact high is is like almost nothing. You know, one will be twenty point zero three four nine six one two, and then unless the other one is exactly that, uh, you won't have a tie. But if you have, let's say, if your application is very sensitive and you need to have a high confidence in the accuracy then maybe your application would, would say if there's not a significant margin of, of uh, confidence, then maybe you skip it or something like that. So that, that's an application layer decision. Right, you wouldn't get a tie if you had over 50% confidence. That's also the case, the case yeah. 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 By definition, yeah. Um, okay, so convolutional layers. I showed you the CovNet demo. I'll actually show you the Open Frameworks demos uh, more probably next week, but maybe maybe a little bit later today. Um, and, but this was one of them. I showed you the demo where we put, you know, put myself in front of the camera and the phone and everything, and we got classifications. Okay, so now let's talk about training. Um, so this is this is gonna be, this, this will be great. So training, first of all, why why is training such a big deal? Like what is so hard about it? Because actually like if you, if you really look at even even with CubNets, but but especially neural networks, 
Um, something like this has been known to us for, 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 you know, variations of it have been known since antiquity, basically, because, you know, the idea of composite functions having a very high sort of expressiveness, it has been known to mathematicians for many, 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 many moons. And so the idea that you can learn a function uh, through uh, this kind of representation where there's, where there's a lot of flexibility for the function has been known forever. So why is it that we, not forever, but for a long time. So why is it that only now we're coming around to actually using them? Um, well, the reason is because um, it turns out that that finding what those numbers should be, those magic numbers, is actually really, really challenging. Even if we know how to do it theoretically, practically speaking, it's very challenging. So why is it very challenging? Well, take this for example. Uh, well, actually, okay, so the, the, first, the first point we have to make, which is kind of uh, indicated by this visual, is that uh, the weights, um, they are they're not linearly independent, right? Because a neural network, all of the, all of the neurons have nonlinearities, and so if you change one weight, you uh, change you change, first of all, all of the, the, you change the activations not only uh, where in the neuron that that weight is going to, but also in all of the subsequent neurons and other layers, right? So if you change this right here, like make a change to this one, then, um, then this neuron is affected, the other ones are not. However, this neuron, since it's affected, it affects all of the neurons that it connects to, which is all of these. And so then, because all of these neurons are affected, now affects all of these. Basically all of the connections, the activation that passes through them are changed. Um, and the, the net effect of this, and also they're not changed linearly, they're kind of changed in a way that's nonlinear. Non um, now the effect of this is that um, you cannot optimize weights one at a time. So if there's, if you have a thousand weights, a thousand parameters in your neural, neural network, you know, maybe you would think that, okay, I'll figure out what the best weight for weight one is and then figure out the best weight for weight two, and the best weight for weight three individually, but you can't actually do that. Um, you have to optimize them all at the same time. So you can understand why that starts to become a big problem if you have a lot of weights because, um, so, okay, well, and you'll see why when we take the naive approach. So the naive approach would be, okay, we have a, we have a function that has many weights, many parameters, how about we just take random guesses and then, you know, pick the one that then measure their accuracy and then pick the best one. So if you have a neural network that has two neurons or, two, or rather two weights, right, then maybe you can take each of those weights, divide it, divide the, uh, divide each one into sort of 10 guesses. You know, let, let, let's say all of your guesses, let's say all of the weights are constrained to be between zero and one. So then you can take that zero to one axis and then divide it into 10 buckets and then do it for each of the weights and try each combination of two of them. So then you would have 100 buckets, 100 guesses. So 100 guesses, you know, computer can do that pretty quickly. And then one of them will be your, your best one. But, um, uh, but of course, if you have three neurons, if you have three weights here, then it's not 100, it's 1,000, right? In other words, the number of guesses that you'd have to take to, to achieve a particular precision would be, would, uh, scales exponentially with the number of weights, right? In, in fact, the exponent is the number of weights. So how many weights do modern neural networks have? Well, they have like 100 million. So, um, so in order to take guesses with, a, um, with that kind of a, with that same precision, you'd have to take 10 to the 100 million number of guesses. So that's a, that's a 100 million digit long number, right? Um, that's a lot of digits. Um, so actually, uh, yeah, I like this. So basically, well, okay, I'll, I'll read this in a second, but, but think, think about like, just, just to scale that, the number of atoms in the universe is an 80 digit number. So the number of atoms in the universe is 80 digits. And the number of guesses you'd have to take to achieve a 10% precision on, which isn't even that much, 10% um, precision on a 100 million uh, weight neural network is, um, 
is a hundred million digits. So it's basically you know you can make a cal you can make a computer start guessing and it'll take until the end of the century times a, 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 a zillion basically, um, and then you won't even get close. So basically, this doesn't work. Um, even for our fastest computers, uh, because yeah, okay, that yeah. So and actually, that's that's a modern neural network. But even the one that we showed last week, the two layer, the two layer fully connected MNIST neural network has eight thousand parameters. That's a really really simple neural network, eight thousand parameters. So even that's an eight thousand digit number. So it's just not tenable. Um, yeah, modern covnets have something like seven orders of magnitude in terms of the number of neurons that they have. Um, they have roughly in the tens of millions of parameters. I think it's moving into hundreds of millions actually, um, which is uh, similar to frog brains. So frog brains have roughly that this number of, of neurons and connections between the neurons. Human brains have, um, have another three, uh, three orders of magnitude um, on the neurons and synapses. So that's pretty, that's pretty crazy. So we're actually, even our biggest neural networks right now, they don't have as many, as many neurons as a normal human brain. But we're actually catching up like that. We should be able to model human scale neural networks within some, I think some number of years or a decade or something like that, if you extrapolate current patterns. Um, they still won't be as functional as human brains because human uh, brains have all these complexities that neural networks drop. Um, so for example, like delayed firing and, you know, kind of nonlinear firing pattern and things like that. But, um, yeah, well, it's, it's still, it's still quite a lot. Uh, yeah. So is this a hardware limitation or more of like an algorithm limitation? Uh, both. Um, it's. It, the, there's definitely a hardware limitation in that it, in that you um, it becomes a little bit inefficient to try to I mean we can't we have only so much memory in the computer that can be allotted I mean maybe you could have many computers but then you run into a new problem which is like communication costs between them um, and also there's alg algorithmic problems like our, our algorithms do not always scale up to another order of magnitude um, they come pretty close to deep learning, but, but it seems like every time we have a new uh, order of magnitude, someone has to come up with a new trick to figure out how to scale them. So ReLU was one thing that was kind of, a, you know, before we had ReLU, we had a bottleneck, too many neurons, sigmoids would die, basically, uh, Spanish <laughs> gradient problem. Now there's other ones, you know, unstable training and so on. I think it's pretty close, but it seems like, it seems like, yeah, both are limitations. Um, oh yeah, I already mentioned it. So yeah, why random search is hard. 80 digits is the number of atoms in the universe. Uh, weight combinations of AlexNet to 10% precision is, is, yeah, is this many. So what is that? That's a, it's almost a hundred million. So it's 60, only 62 million. So it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Um, okay. So let's, uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually scale up from a very, very simple example, how we might train a machine learning algorithm to a more complicated example. And I'm going to try to reduce the, the amount of math, the reduced number of equations, but still we'll kind of approach some math so you can get like kind of a sense of how this works. So the simplest possible machine learning is linear regression. And everyone has done this. I, well, maybe not everyone, but almost all of you have probably done this at some point. If you've ever seen the line of best fit in a like you know high school analysis class, or I don't know what they call it in different places, but um, you know pre-calculus, let's say, or statistics, you might have seen something like this, where you're given a set of points in 2D, and then you're asked to find the line of best fit. So, like, is there a line that best approximates these points? And you can kind of see it with your eye. It's like roughly this, right? My mouse is kind of going through it, right? But the question is, can you figure out what it is? Um, well, okay, so like, you know, we let's, let's look at three random ones, right? So here I picked three random lines through the, this plot, F1, F2, F3. Which one is best, right? Um, intuitively, it seems like the second one's not so good, right? 
Um, maybe the first one and the third one look like they're both kind of plausible, but still we have this question like which is actually better, you know? So the way that this is figured out is that you can actually quantify just how much you like the line of best fit. So the, the line of best fit, of course, gives you where th that function would predict that no, that value should be. And so you can measure the difference between the actual value and the predicted value. Um, and then, um, you know, maybe you can average the error or you can use mean squared error, which is a pretty standard one. So mean squared error says, uh, or actually here it's sum squared error, but mean squared error is, is this, is the average of, of these values instead, but basically it's the same. So the idea is you take all of these error bars, you square them and you add them. And if you want, you can take the average, you know, that then will still all be the same, but basically you're summing the squares here. Um, so that gives you an expression in error, like the, the amount of error that your line of best fit has, let's call it J. Um, so, or, so you might hear loss function or sometimes you'll hear cost function. Cost or loss uh, basically express how bad our fit is and we want to minimize how bad it is. So if, um, uh, what are we doing here? Oh yeah, okay, so so another, you'll see if, oh no. Well, yeah, okay, fine. Um, maybe this is, maybe this is, um, TMI right now, but but like like this is this is for regression basically. If you have a regression, you're trying to fit a line of best fit. If you have a classification, then uh, what you might have is um, one output neuron for each of the classes, and it gets some value, and then you want to interpret them all as probabilities. And so um, one common way of doing this is using what's called a softmax activation, which is instead of having like a maximum, like a ReLU, you run it through this, which is called the softmax, softmax function. It takes that out, the output of the last neuron Z, and then um, like ZI is the ith neuron, and then it actually uses it as the exponent to E, like the exponential constant, 2.71 roughly, and then it divides by the sum of all of them. So then, then they all sum together to one. Uh, again, this is maybe like a little bit more detailed than you really need. Like, don't worry about it too much. Um, but the point is that you, the softmax is very, you'll, if you ever see softmax, it means this. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and, oh yeah. And then, and then it turns out that mean squared error is not usually used for classification. Instead, there's something called cross entropy is used, cr categorical cross entropy, which is like, um, like the idea here is that if y, um, like y and y, y is the actual and y hat here is the predicted value, um, or sorry, it's the other way around actually. Um, and then if they're the same, then this turns out to be zero. So then you would sum all of these and it would be zero. That means exactly the same, zero error. If they're different, then you're gonna have a very high, um, these will be very large and then you sum them together even larger um, and so on. So it's kind of, yeah, that's the, that's the idea. The exact loss function is not, not important to us. The point is the loss function gets bigger the more error that we have. Um, okay, so if, let's, let's go back to our regression example. Um, we, can, we can actually plot the cost function for different combinations of M and B, right? So remember, if, we're, if we have the, this function, which is J is our mean squared error, and um, uh, j is our mean squared error, and then if, and then remember the, the actual function is, has two parameters, m and b. And so if you set m and b to different values and then just try them out and plug them in and see what the cost is, you'll see that the actual error is shaped like a bowl, like the, like the loss function is shaped like a bowl. And of course we wanna be, we want the lowest possible error so the lowest possible error is the bottom of that bowl. It's in the very, you know, you imagine you have a big bowl and it's the bottom of that bowl, right? And so we want to get to the bottom of the bowl, right? Um, what a funny way of looking at it, right? Getting to the bottom of the bowl. Um, so, so, okay, well, how would we actually do that, right? Well, the, the, the idea is this, that you can, so first of all, this is, you, you wouldn't actually, <laughs> 
do this for linear regression because linear regression you can actually solve for the bottom of the bowl analytically. Uh, but suppose you couldn't do that. Then one thing you could do is let's say start at a random start with a random guess, right? So start with a random guess. Let's say we start right here, and then calculate the slope of the bowl at that point, and then whatever the slope is, go down in that direction, right? Because you want to get lower, and so figure out what the slope is. You can calculate it analytically there, or not analytically, but you can calculate it experimentally, and then. Um, go down a little bit more and then calculate the this is called the gradient by the way gradient is slope it's just another way of saying slope um, gradient is basically slope in more than where there's more than one dimension um, it's one way of looking at it so the idea is that you just keep on doing this like you at every step you figure out what the slope of the of the your loss surface is and then go down a little bit and you can't go down too much because um, you know you may figure out the direction but the direction that goes lower changes as you go so you want to go in little steps so go down 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 until at some point you get to the bottom of the bowl and the slope is zero or it's too small to to really care about and then you stop and so then you go this must be the best parameterization because it achieves the lowest loss that I've found so far and it does so super efficiently because now we don't have to take random guesses we can just follow a path from from something bad to something better um, so that's it basically now in neural networks um, it's somewhat more complicated but roughly speaking this is this is more or less how it works um, so that's kind of that's kind of cool. Right? It's actually really simple. Uh, it's like a little bit too much math. Maybe I'm I'm I can leave this as an exercise. I know this is not like a math school. Um, I do enjoy this, but but I won't torture you too much. But basically, this is a derivation of the gradient. So if you, how many people here have taken calculus? Okay, well um, then you should. This should all work. This should all be like familiar to you. If you're taking calculus, like to, to get the gradient, so what is the gradient? The gradient is actually just the vector whose elements are the partial, partial derivative of each of the loss function with respect to each parameter. So our parameters are m and b. And so basically the derivative of, of uh, j with respect to m and the derivative of j with respect to b. Right? That gives us the, the way that the error changes with respect to each individual parameter. So basically, we can calculate each of these. So for example, so for the slope of m, you can follow this out. I'll provide all the slides. This is standard calculus. This is why there's a one half because then it gets rid of the with you carry down the two, right? You and then you reduce the exponent by one, and then you do use the chain rule to grab the inner product, and basically blah 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 blah. You get this, right? Um, and then same thing for G, for b. You get blah blah blah. You get this. Now, um, this is what I mentioned before, why I started laughing a little bit, is that um, like if you show this to someone who does linear, like, you know, you, you, would, you would never actually do this for linear regression because for linear regression, you can actually solve these. You can, you can um, if you, you solve these and then basically all you have to do is just figure out where this is zero. So you can actually solve it analytically, right? Because the bottom of the bowl will have a slope of zero everywhere. And so just set it to zero and then figure out what m and x, what m and b, you have two equations with two variables, you can, you can find where they intersect. Um, so you can solve linear regression that way. Um, however, uh, the reason why, why we do it with this, with this gradient descent method, where you kind of go down iteratively, is because with neural networks, because they're nonlinear, you can't actually um, solve analytically. There's no known way to do it. And so, so therefore, this is the method that you would use uh, for that, for you know, because you can't solve it analytically. Um, if you do this process analytically, and then you, cal I have a notebook on this, by the way, in case anyone's actually, in case anyone, like by some, for some reason, wants to do this, like it's it's available for you. Um, so, if you actually do this process, so the way the way you would do it, right? You would calculate the each partial derivative. And then you would pick some, some uh, parameter called alpha, let's say, 
um, and that's called the learning rate. And you would multiply the learning rate by the gradient and then subtract from each of the parameters, you would subtract, you would basically go down the gradient by a little bit and the little bit is controlled, is modulated by this parameter. That's why we call it the learning rate. If the learning rate is very high, we take big steps. If the learning rate is really low, we take small steps. Um, now there's a trade off. It's, there's a trade off between big and small. If we take big steps that are too big, we might overshoot where we're going. Like you might, uh, because the direction of the actual gradient changes um, at a very, very microscopic level, it doesn't change, but at a large level, it does change. And so if you go in steps that are too big, you might go in the wrong direction, basically. If you go in steps that are too small, then you, um, you'll you probably more or less go in the right direction, but you it may take too long. And so this is a, in practice, this the learning rate is a hyper, what's called a hyperparameter. Um, which, which I've always thought is a wrong name for it. I've always thought it should be called a meta parameter. That's just my, I don't know, it makes more sense to call it a meta parameter, but for whatever reason they're called hyperparameters. <laughs> hyperparameters are basically all of the things that you have to set, which aren't the parameters themselves, the weights. It's like the, the learning uh, process has a bunch of sort of hyperparameters to set. Did you have a question? Oh, um, I guess in, in principle it doesn't have to be, uh, but there's not, doesn't seem to be any, uh, as far as I know, there's not really anything, uh, well actually that's not entirely true because um, there, uh, in this, this is like the simplest version of gradient descent. Um, it's not clear why you would use a different learning rate for all of the different parameters because um, you don't know you know, relative to each other, how much they should be changing. Um, there's, there are more complex gradient descent methods, or more complex, um, well, you'll see when we get into the, the actual, like this is vanilla gradient descent basically, and I have a few more that, that try to improve upon this, that do actually have something like that. It, it, in, it's, in practice, it's not by making the uh, learning rate the same for all of them, but, but, um, but something that has almost the same effect. Um, basically choosing the learning rate automatically and where it ends up being different for each one. Uh, but, but yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay, like if we have two inputs, let's say, two neurons, then instead of having a, uh, a line of best fit, we have a plane of best fit, right? That's all it is, right? Because now we're modeling a plane and so maybe you have a bunch of points in this in this uh, 3D space and we're trying to fit a plane through them. And it really works more or less the same way. However, of course, um, yeah, and so if we're doing linear regression, then then you would have three parameters, but they're they're all basically the same. Like it's it's roughly equivalent to how it worked in the 2D example, um, but you just have one extra parameter and then you still get this sort of like this, um, you know, optimization. Okay, now the problem with linear regression is that it's we love it. It's simple, easy, really easily solvable. But as we said last week, linear planes, they're just, they're just not expressive enough. Let's, uh, I like to say that they're not expressive because you can't bend them, they're flat. You can't make them represent more complicated kind of, um, more complicated kind of data, data distributions. So that doesn't work. And so we have to complicate everything horribly by introducing a nonlinearity. And we already mentioned this last week. Um, neural networks kind of started off with sigmoid nonlinearities. Non sigmoid looks like this. Turns out that sigmoids have, um, are difficult to train in practice. And so um, but then this is what it would actually look like, a sigmoid. So you see that it takes that flat plane and it makes it curved. In practice, we usually use ReLU, uh, which looks like this. Um, and um, so where is this going? I already showed this last week. So yeah, if we add another layer, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Same weight update rule, but need to find. Um, yeah. So like if you have a neural network, um, which has multiple layers, then now we need to find, we need to calculate the, uh, the, the sort of slope with respect to each individual weight. And so there's like a DJ, DW, or del j del w for each of these 
Um, so the number of parameters goes up, then the number, then the dimensionality of our gradient goes up as well. Um, now, gradient descent, right? Like the, the idea is that um, we'd like to be able to calculate the gradient manually, right? Um, so, so yeah, this, this question is now getting into how do we actually calculate the gradient, right? So gradient is just a fancy way of saying derivative, right? Slope, derivative, gradient, all the same thing basically. Gradient just means slope or derivative in multiple dimensions. Um, so you probably learned in calculus that you know you can calculate the gradient manually by basically taking taking two points in the function that are really really close to each other and measuring the slope between them, right? So this is the whole limit formula of calculus, right? Um, and uh, for partial derivatives, it's the same thing, right? It's just it's just the using this this manual approach. However, um, the the yeah. So the problem is this is we love this because it's super simple. You know, it's just the derivative formula, but um, it's not practical because again, a neural network has a hundred million. Uh, uh, it's in a hundred million dimensions, right? Or, or maybe let's say ten million. There's let's say there's ten million parameters. Well, that means that you would have to do this for 10 million, you would have to do this 10 million times, um, and, and actually you'd have to do it 20 million times because you actually have to calculate J with a small you know, perturbance here and J without one. So you'd have to do it twice for each parameter. Um, so this just not like run, doing a forward pass of a neural network actually takes like, maybe it takes like a few tens of milliseconds. It might take that much. That doesn't sound like a lot, but if you have a hundred million uh, parameters and you need to, or well, let's say ten million parameters, and then you need to do this twenty million times, twenty million times a few tens of milliseconds means means uh, I don't know that each forward pass is going to take you like a long time. May, maybe it'll take you a minute, let's say, and a minute doesn't sound like a long time, but again, this has to be done a lot, a lot, a lot of times. Basically, it's just not practical. Um, to to do this right and this this is in fact what what I'm describing this has been known for a, at least a hundred years like this would take too long we cannot optimize functions that have too many parameters because because computationally it, it takes too long um, so lo and behold a technique called backpropagation came along and um, we're not going to cover backprop in too much detail um, but backprop, you can. I have some links for that in the slides that will will actually describe exactly how backprop works in the in a reasonably sort of user friendly way. Um, the idea of backprop was that it's a it's a fun, it's a it's a algorithm for efficiently calculating the gradient, and by efficient I mean it calculates the gradient fast, um, fast enough that it could actually be used in. Um, you know, in training a neural network, we could use it to actually perform the gradient um, gradient descent reasonably fast enough. And by reasonably fast enough, I mean you know some of the, these models still take a few weeks to train. Um, so so backprop is responsible for getting it down to a few weeks to train rather than a few hundreds of millions of years. Um, and um, and so that was really the thing that kind of made machine learning or made neural networks actually practically possible. So um, you'll hear a lot about how, uh, if you read about this, you'll see that like one, that scientists often like to say that basically we can calculate the gradient efficiently using the chain rule. And, and maybe it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's roughly, that's roughly accurate. The idea is that as you do a forward pass, you can actually keep track of how much each neuron is, has been changed by a small change, by a small what weight update, you keep track of all of them, and then you get to the end and you measure the error, and then you can actually allocate how much of the error is due to each individual weight. And then you can do what's called a backwards pass, where you take that error and you distribute it, sort of something like that, you distribute it to all of the weights individually and update them according to that. Um, and what this means is that instead of doing 20 million, um, you know, 20 million forward, forward passes, you can just do one forward pass 
and then one backwards pass, which is the same as a forwards pass except in reverse, and then uh, change the weights as you go. And so this this works basically 10 million times faster than it would work doing gradient descent manually. And uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who is now an extremely famous computer scientist because of this, figured out how to do this. He applied it to neural networks in, in the mid 80s. And actually backprop, gradient descent is a, actually a very gen general um, algorithm. It's actually used in a lot more things than just machine learning. It's just generic, you know, multi multi parameter functional optimization. So you see it in a lot of different contexts. Um, and so backprop was was applied to gradient descent uh, for the purpose of training neural networks by Jeffrey Hinton in the 80s and, and a few collaborators. And that was really kind of a landmark moment. They came out with a paper without very much fanfare because most people thought neural networks were dead at the time. Um, but they figured out a way to make it work. And then about 10 years later, uh, Jeffrey Hinton's grad student, Jan LeCun, um, made the first digit recognition system, which I showed you last week. Um, Jeffrey Hinton and Jan LeCun are both now Turing winners. So this is like basically land landmark stuff. Um, so you can spend a whole PhD learning how backprop works. And I just explained it to you in 30 seconds. <laughs> so don't you feel smart? Um, yeah? Okay. My intuition, like, my intuition about this is like basically when you mean that you're going, that you're passing the errors backwards. Wait, wait. So you're yeah. kind of solving, you're kind of doing gradient descent one layer of the network at a time. Yeah. Okay. You could say so. So you do gradient descent for like the last layer and then the errors move whatever. There's some way of taking the errors yeah, I mean, and moving them to the layer before then you do gradient descent. On you're doing layer. backprop one layer at a time and this whole procedure basically does gradient descent. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Let me ask another question. So, gradient descent finds a local minimum. Yes. So, do do we also? Is there also stuff like? Um, I mean, there's the local minimum may be nowhere near the actual minimum. Yeah. Um, do do they also do things like? I can't remember what it's called, but I know in these kind of observations, there's like find the local minimum and then maybe jump to another random part to see if you can get a better local minimum like hill, um, hill jumping kind of yeah there there um like you want to jump to another neighborhood of the space because there might be a much better local minimum yeah there. so so there's all sorts of variations of of uh i'm actually going to show a few different flavors of of gradient descent that will actually like kind of um answer that um i mean the Random hopping almost sounds more like like genetic algorithms where you have like 10 different, you know Locations and you know, you can do a sort of grid, like a grid search that way right. But I mean there's there's it, there's ways of escaping local minima and actually the next next couple of slides are about that So oh, okay. I'm just getting to it. So yeah, so gradient descent why uh, is is wonderful. We love it, but um, again like in reality the loss function does not look like a bowl in the neural network. The loss function looks more like this. And actually, it looks more like this in 100 million dimensions, remember. So this is what it would look like in two dimensions. In 100 million dimensions, it looks the same except 100 million more dimensions. And, um, and so it's super bumpy. So if you do gradient descent, you might get stuck in, as what was said, what's called a local minimum. You might get to the bottom of some little bowl in the bigger plane here. Um, and then you might go, oh, the loss function is no longer declining. I must be done. But maybe you're actually in, in a very high local minimum, right? So, um, so th this is a problem, local minimum and also saddle points. And saddle points are also little areas where the slope is suddenly zero, right? Um, so how do we get around this? So the way to get around this is instead of doing, there's a few, there's a few methods that are used and I'm going to kind of introduce them at a very topical way. Like I'll just kind of give you the abstract, 
Um, because now when you hear about these things reading papers, as I'm sure all of you will be reading papers from archive within no time, um, you uh, will hear these terms a lot and now you'll be a lot more prepared to understand what they are, at least at a high level. So this is so that this problem of local minima happens, you know, pretty easily if you if you kind of deal, if you just do, you know, sort of what's called batch gradient descent. Batch gradient descent is calculating the gradient for the entire data set and then moving in that whole direction. But there are a bunch of things that scientists have figured out how to do, which um, which actually end up working better and working better for various reasons. One reason is that they reduce the um, they reduce the um, problem of, of getting stuck in local minima, they also um, are somewhat more computationally efficient. So one thing you can do is what's called stochastic gradient descent. And st stochastic means basically random. And what it means is that instead of calculating the gradient with respect to your entire training set, you calculate the gradient according to one random example. And so depending on which example you choose, the gradient is going to be different. And so if the gradient is different and you're choosing it at a different different example every every single time then you're gonna have a very you know sort of like your lost surface is 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 kind of you know at every at every single point that you calculated the lost surface actually changes slightly or the gradient changes slightly rather um, your calculation of the gradient changes a little bit and so what happens is that um, you know, you can almost imagine it's like a ball moving through the space of parameters and that ball is really, really bumpy, jumpy. You know, it's kind of like shuffling around. It's like, it's like full of electricity. And so it might kind of like, instead of getting stuck in the local minimum, it might just kind of like ram through it. You know, just kind of jump out of it, something like that. Um, now, the, the problem with stochastic gradient descent is that it may be slightly too bumpy. So you may sort of end up like not not following a very robust path because basing the calculation of the gradient on one example is not very accurate, right? Because you might pick an example which is kind of like not representative and so the gradient for it might be totally different so you might go in the wrong direction for an example. But if you average it out over time it might work decent. Uh, but what works best and what's used in, in practice all the time is basically batch gradient descent. Uh, sorry, sorry uh, mini batch gradient descent. Um, it, this is a little confusing. Sometimes you'll uh, gradient stochastic gradient descent and and mini batches mini batch gradient descent are used are, are sort of like the the terms are confused for each other, even by scientists. Like stochastic gradient descent sometimes just means mini batch gradient descent, but but it doesn't. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> so anyway, mini mini batch gradient descent means you take your data set and you divide it into a bunch of batches. And the batches are, you know, like subsets. Like let's say you have ten batches, and then you calculate the gradient based on each batch, and then do it based on that. And if you do that, you get something that looks kind of like um, this green line. So it's it's not as jagged as stochastic gradient descent, uh, but it's jagged enough that you might sort of get yourself out of a of a local minimum that way, and it's faster. Um, now again, like not to get into too, not to dwell with too much, too much. Um, if you're if you're allergic to equations, like don't worry about them. I'm going to describe these kind of in a poetic sense. Um, so, like the so basically the standard weight update is this, right? And th this should make sense, right? Basically, look at this piece, right? The our weights are W, right? So we start with at some time step t, we have a set of weights W. And then we calculate the gradient. The, the symbol for the gradient is this upside down um, delta. So the gradient of the error with respect to each parameter is calculated this way. We multiply that by the learning rate and then we subtract it from, we subtract this from the weights and we get a new set of weights. So that's the standard, right? With, a, with any, of the, any of these, right? Let's say we do mini batch gradient descent, it would work like this. Um, now, uh, many, uh, the standard weight update rule, which is this, is never used because um, because it's kind of naive, and it, so there's a, it it also gets stuck in local minima, and so typically what you see these days are um, weight update rules that are slightly more complicated that have various nice properties. So one thing you can do is you can um, have something called momentum. 
So momentum says that you don't like like now imagine that the ball has has velocity and it doesn't just like it doesn't just stop somewhere. It actually moves with some momentum. So like every time you calculate the gradient, you're kind of accelerating the velocity in a certain direction, but but the velocity remains, right? So it's kind of like this slower to to change uh, the, the actual velocity. Uh, momentum is exactly what it sounds like, right? So, so if you calculate your gradient in this direction, and then and then the next step it's this direction, you're you're still kind of like going in the direction from before. You're just beginning to turn, um, and this also helps you avoid getting stuck in local minima because if you get stuck in local minima, well, you still have a little bit of momentum to maybe push you out of it, even if you end up going up a little bit, just you know, just to begin with. So that's momentum. Then there are like variations of momentum that try to get rid of different problems again i'm gonna i'm gonna skip this in the interest of not dwelling in too much detail um but there's this there's this kind of nester of momentum which i don't know if anyone really uses anywhere but um then these are the most popular so this is what you'll see a lot in in um in papers if you read them is basically um what are called adaptive methods and adaptive methods attempt to to basically um while while descending the gradient, they actually try to kind of um, adapt to the conditions that they happen to be in and change either the learning rate or um, uh, well, basically they all affect the learning rate more or less. They try to change the learning rate as they go. Um, I'm gonna yeah. So again, you can look these up. I've heard the rule that like when in doubt, use Adam. Um, Adam stands for what is it? Adapt. I forgot. Adapt. AD, I think, is just adaptive, but, but what is the AM? And I don't remember. But basically, Adam, Adam is super popular. It's only like two, a couple of years old. And all of the, and there might even be newer ones, for all I know. But um, all of these are, oops, all of these are methods that, um, that improve the weight update rule such that it, deals better with bumpy surfaces. Another explanation for why local minimum aren't, aren't such a big deal that I'm aware of is that um, for some reason when you have like, you know, maybe when you have 20 parameters or 50 parameters, local minimum are a big deal. But when you have a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred thousand, apparently all local minima begin to sort of approach the global minima. And this is something that um, I'm, I don't fully understand myself. Jan Lukun has some, some, he says something like this. It all sounds very magical though. But in any case, apparently local minima are not a big deal in machine learning somehow. And now that we've solved local minima, it seems to be that's why machine learning is working. Um, so a few other terminologies that you'll hear in this, uh, you know, learn, you'll hear a lot about these different terminologies. One thing you'll hear about is overfitting. So what is overfitting? Overfitting means that you take a, your model, it over, it over um, sort of bends itself to, to accommodate the peculiarities of your training set. And this is a problem because maybe it's, so okay, let me, let me give you actually a, an example of overfitting. I have a, a coin which has heads or tails and I flip the coin three times and it lands heads every time. And then you go, this coin has a 100% probability of landing on heads. So this is what overfitting means. Uh, but basically means that you take your, your evidence too seriously. Um, and so in the case of like linear regression, for example, let's say you have these points. You see these dots? So oops, pretty clearly a line of best fit should look something like this. But you could come up with a function that basically gets exactly, hits all of those points exactly with perfect precision. Well, this function is probably not very good because it won't generalize to new data because it's over specialized to the training set. So that's basically what overfitting means. And overfitting is the nemesis of machine learning. It's the, it's the kryptonite, you know, it's the sort of Lex Luthor um, of machine learning. It's a constant problem that um, machine learning scientists have to deal with because there's lots of ways of overfitting uh, and it's not always obvious that you are overfitting. Um, there's, and there's various things that we do 
sort of to try to avoid overfitting. One way of trying to avoid overfitting is by having an extra thing that we're trying to optimize in the cost function. So the cost function we said before is trying to just optimize the error of the, of the actual function. But we could also try to minimize some sort of another thing, which is kind of like the cost of, of so, so one thing we might want to try to do is reduce the complexity of the model. Um, there's a law in philosophy called Occam's, Ra Occam's razor. How many people are, you f are familiar with Occam's razor? Yeah. Who wants their state Occam's razor? Um, the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. Right. The simplest explanation is preferred. Right. Um, so back when um, back when when people believed that the Earth was the center of the the universe and all of the uh, planets and the sun revolved around the earth, um, there was a problem that astronomers had, which was that if you observe the other planets, they attempt, they sometimes appear to move backwards, right? So like if you're following the path of, this is true, if you follow the path of Jupiter or something, it kind of, it, it seems to rotate around the earth, but then sometimes it'll kind of like go back a little bit. And so astronomers who were committed to the explanation that, um, that the, that the Earth is the center of the universe and everything revolves around the Earth, had to come up with this system of epicycles in which the each of the other planets were orbiting something else, which was then orbiting around the Earth. So then, like, basically Jupiter would be, like, kind of doing this around, around the Earth. And that would explain uh, why it apparently went backwards, right? But that really complicates your model of the universe, right? And so then someone came along with a simpler explanation, which is that, hey, maybe the sun is the center of the universe. All of the planets revolve around the sun. And so the reason why Jupiter looks that way is because sometimes, sometimes basically you, because the, the orbit of Jupiter is bigger than, than, than Earth. And so Earth is kind of doing this and then Jupiter is doing this. You kind of, it's really hard for me to do this with my fingers, but you get the idea, right? A lot simpler explains, explains the, the deviation in a much simpler way. So we, we like simple explanations of things. And so one uh, way of trying to do this in machine learning land is to try to penalize the model from having, in, uh, from being overly complex. And one way of it being overly complex is actually just having large parameters. If the weights themselves are super large, it's as though every weight is trying to overcorrect for something. So you have a function which is re having wild swings. And so the nor normal uh, error function looks like this. We can add a term to it called a regularization term, which basically penalizes the, uh, the magnitudes of the weights. And so now there's actually two things that we're trying to optimize a little bit, um, which is, um, the actual loss of the the actual accuracy of the or the loss of the function itself and the regularization term and then there's this parameter gamma which controls how important is the regularization to you um so that and that's another hyperparameter that has to be solved um then there's all these other ways of of dealing with overfitting dropout is this super like like kind of clever technique invented by jeffrey hinton who you've already heard about um jeffrey hinton said Hey, how about when we do the weight updates, uh, we randomly just like don't update some of the weights. So like you just pick a random amount of them and then you don't actually, whatever you find the gradient for them to be, don't actually update them. Turns out this actually works really well and it's almost, it's almost standard now. Um, and the reason is because you, like the explanation is kind of like uh, the model learns not to rely too much on one or two neurons because they're not going to be rely they're not always going to be available to change. And so somehow this works basically <laughs> um, experimentally. Okay, so um, for further reading, please consult the following. I'm going to put the slides online and everything. so um, by the way, do we have like um, uh, at ITP do we have some sort of a, like hosting that I could put slides on, some sort of a shared drive? No, nothing like I that. Think most teachers just have a drive. They just put it online, yeah. 
I have, for some reason I can't find where, but anyway, all right, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll be sharing the slides, but that was just checking. So, okay, yeah, anyway, if you want to understand uh, how neural networks are trained in more detail, please read these, uh, read my website um, on the ML for Aid, that how neural networks are trained. These articles by Sebastian Ruder, Andre Karpathy, and Michael Nielsen are all really, really nice. Um, and they describe in some, you know, uh, in some detail how this works. Now, I, I'm sure that for a lot of you, like maybe that explanation was like TMI, but um, I can promise you that, that it's TMI for everybody the first time they hear it. And it's really useful to get other people's explanations. It, when you listen to 10 people's explanations of the same thing, you, your brain kind of converges on the thing that's common to all of them and you start to understand. Um, so, so all of that stuff is, is all um, super useful and I would highly encourage you to, to look into that. And so now, yes, now you should understand. Is everyone familiar with this meme? With the brain expanding meme? How many people have seen this before? The, not, not, not the actual, this particular one, but the brain expanding meme? So, okay, like, so I have an idea to train a neural network. Gradient descent, that's, that's your, you know, your first thought. But then, wait a minute, maybe genetic algorithm is even better. Or Bayesian optimization. Or brute force search, which just means that you try every possible guess. Or random search, or of course, like, the, and you're the master of the universe if you can train a neural network by making a guess and it being correct. So... I thought it was funny. So. Um, okay, so we're back to where we were last uh, last week, and I think let me just check like um, how many slides I how many more slides basically. Yeah, okay. So we basically got we talked about this last week how transfer learning is kind of the basis for a lot of uh, a lot of different applications, like including all the ones basically we looked at with ML five last week. Um, so we talked about how you can use a large neural network to train a, a smaller neural network and that that smaller neural network therefore needs a lot fewer examples and, um, and it, it also can be a lot smaller, which is really sort of a nice feature, um, computation speaking. And, um, and so yeah, we looked at these slides last week and then we talked about ML5. We showed some demos. And uh, what I'm gonna do now, or actually like, I, now we'll basically, why don't we just go ahead and take a break and then after we get back, I'm going to uh, finish up some of the ML5 examples and then show you runway and then we'll see about what can get an ML3 effects. We'll see if that fits. I think maybe we'll get to some of it. So, okay, let's take a quick break and uh, be back here 440. Yeah, can you do that? Oh, did oh, you have a question, yeah? Oh, kind of, so a question, but in, in that meme, so like, yeah. So so basically, it's like the ones at the top are the most effective. Um. Right? Or or and like. The bottom, uh, it, the bottom would be like incredible if you could get an initial guess and get it done. Yeah. Like genetic algorithms have been used, but they're like not as good as true. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess so. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's just like like complicating your model or okay. complicating your idea. Yeah. I, I'm, I was curious if like use genetic algorithms and be in optimization. What's apps. what's least effective way of doing something? Yeah. Right. So, more complicated, least effective. Okay, cool. Let's uh, take a quick break. <coughs> okay. So the thing to get back to is um, we um, introduced ML five yesterday. And uh, or not yesterday, last week, and then we showed uh, we showed a bunch of examples, and then I, th I think maybe. Well, okay, let's let's get some feedback. So, I mean, how many people used ML five a little bit? Like, do you have any? Did anyone try to make anything? I just turned it on, got it working, and then. Stopped. Okay. Anybody actually try to modify the examples? Which one? The PostNet demo? Okay, what was it? Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, do, do you also? Yeah, I mean, I just used the, um, uh, the, the simple model where you train the A and B classi uh, classifiers, um, and I 
used it to recognize when you are like doing bicep curls. So like it's like a, it's a motivator. So like give you these uh, very dramatic um, motivational quotes as you like lift your barbell. Okay. Um, cool. Okay. Well, uh, does anyone have any ideas that they just haven't gotten around to, to making? Don't be shy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think. Uh, is there pitch section ML five? I think there's. Someone has an example of that, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of cheating because I've been working on them a little bit for a while, but I uh, applied to adapt um, Taco Drum for it, like the text Oh, yeah. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, okay, cool. So we might get Taco Drum in the. That's the goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taco Drum, there's also. I know the a model by Mozilla, which which was an updated Tacotron, I think it was called it TTS. Is or because there's a second Tacotron that's like with that E, but I think it's just like if you look it up, it's like TTS or something. Uh, text to speech. Let me see. Um, yeah, it's this. Which apparently is updated version of Tacotron. Okay. Yeah, it includes two different model inflations which are based on Tacotron, Tacotron okay. 2. But I don't know, it may not be better or anything. I don't know if this is also in, it's, it's, uh, is this PyTorch? Um, yeah, is that, is that yeah. No, it's PyTorch. That's probably Yeah, 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 fair enough. Uh, that'll be awesome. Get Tacotron and, uh, some text to speech in ML5, that'll be that'll be really nice. So okay. Um, so what I'll do now is I want to show you PoseNet really quickly and and um, and then we'll get to runway. And I'll show you some examples from runway. Uh, first of all, how many people here have installed runway? Everybody? Everyone have an have an account? Anybody use runway a little bit? Try it out? Okay. So okay, fine. So we'll get to that in a minute. Like I, I just really want to quickly go back to the ML for a demos. So if you go to ML for a GitHub.io and you go to demos, you'll see that if we go down a little bit, we looked at these first few, you know, the guitar example and so on. And then there's kind of this PoseNet with sound example, which is kind of like a simple um, a simple usage of PoseNet. So PoseNet is a body tracking uh, algorithm, and I hope this works um, because my the sound is, yes okay not bad. So the interaction is maybe a little bit flawed, but oh look, there's infinite vortex. going on is that uh, PoseNet is basically a machine learning model which gives you skeleton points um, and also face points and then the idea here if you look through the code it's really pretty simple to all of the code that you saw earlier I'm sorry I'm a little jet lag um, it's all the code that you saw earlier last week except there's also this audio code that makes this oscillator 
and runs a whole bunch of, of little bleeps and bloops through a reverb. Um, and so what's going on here is that in, the draw, in um, this draw key points function, which happens on the draw, it basically looks up all the positions, all of the point positions, and then takes the distance between it and the previous time it was found. And if it's bigger than some threshold, it will play, it'll play a note, which is basically um, slightly randomized. That's it. Some weird, weird yeah. stuff. Uh, I assume the, the, the model just, it just outputs an array, right? Yeah. And so it's somewhere in there, there's like, you know, it's just raw line from this point to this point, this point, this point, that's just like in this raw loop, as opposed to, is that where the, the dots and the lines are coming from? The, the, it says run, uh, draw all, of, like in draw, there's two functions here, draw key points um, and draw skeleton. And so skeleton basically connects connects all the lines and then yeah, draw points, just, just put circles on all of them. Um, PostNet isn't how uh, on that computer that you have. How old is it? Is it like a MacBook Air or something? It's a MacBook Pro. Yeah. Try running just the PostNet example by itself and see if it's still that slow because maybe it's the music that's slowing you down or it depends on what it is that you're trying to do like maybe you're doing you're doing some intensive drawing no it's it's just p5 p5 sound library yeah i don't know i'd have to see it it shouldn't it shouldn't get too slow it's a, it's a pretty quick model um, but but yeah, it's hard to say. It, it may be due to the model. It may be due to other things that you're doing, like if you're doing some really intensive drawing um, or intensive audio processing. That shouldn't really do too much, but it could be. Yeah. So just something to, to look up, look at the code specifically, and then um, maybe show it to me at some point. Um, any other questions about PoseNet? Just wanted to show PoseNet real quick. So you know that you have it. Um, actually, let's see what else is there if, besides PoseNet. This will do maybe next week. I think that's about all for the P5, ML5 stuff. Um, no, uh, this, is, this is actually not. Um, this is just viewing a pre-made TSNI. That's been on the um, like that's been on the agenda to add TSNI for ML5. I actually tried to add it last year at some point when um, TensorFlow had a TensorFlow.js had a good TSNI um, implementation, but there was a problem I ran into because of the different versions of TensorFlow.js that were in ML5 and TensorFlow at the time. And so I couldn't do it, but maybe now is a good time to revisit it because that problem has probably been resolved by now. Um, I just haven't had a ton of time. If uh, for those of you who are like proficient JavaScript coders and are interested in developing ML5, I know that that's a big part of the agenda. And I would really like to get TSD in there. So if, if, if you have interest in, in trying to do it, something I can help out. And, um, I'm sure that, uh, that the ML5 team would be much appreciative. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, cool. So um, the demos, we'll kind of leave those aside for now. And what I want to do now is show you guys runway. All right, so runway time. I want you to open runway. Are you in? Wait. So you should get a screen that looks like this. 
So let me know when you when you get to this. Everyone's here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, how many of you have, this is the first time you're opening runway? Mm -hmm. A handful of you? You know, whenever I ask people to raise their hands, what they really do is this. And so then it's not clear to me whether you're waving or raising your hand. Or, <laughs> um, okay, but I'll just assume that one third of you roughly are opening it for the first time. Um, basically, you see this menu, this is the home screen, and um, either one, either of these that you click, it basically does the same thing. It'll just kind of go to the to the main sort of models page. So uh, click onto browse models, and that'll bring up like the full screen runway application. And I'm going to take you first on a little tour of runway. Um, oh, and it seems that um, you might see this on top downloading update as I do. So runway um, downloads updates. Um, automatically and then it reinstalls them so we can kind of do that. You might have this as well. It's probably not 100% necessary for us to update this minute to the next one, but but it's something we can do. Runway um, probably has a new release every week basically, so it's a lot of, uh, a lot of quick updates, so um, quick release cycle. So the basically you have kind of a classic two-pane screen here. On the left, you have your um, what basically a menu of what's called works your workspaces. So the workspace concept here is kind of similar to the uh, workspace concept in Photoshop or in other kinds of software. Works or in Eclipse is also a good example. Workspace is basically just like a little sandbox that you can whatever work that you happen to be doing for a particular project can go. So you can keep different projects separated. So one project may have you know certain models and another project may have other models and so you kind of use them separately. Otherwise it doesn't really have much of a meaning like you can you can kind of put everything in one workspace as I often do um, or make a new workspace for every project doesn't matter. Um, so that's going to be on the left and we'll kind of see that. On the bottom left you'll see there's a menu to create a new model. So this is um, I actually um, made a video tutorial for Runway for exactly how to do this, basically how to make your own model. Um, because the uh, tutorial was like kind of meticulously recorded, it's it's just gonna, I'm not gonna actually do, redo it here. That's just gonna be something that I show you later um, where you can find that. And then in, just in case you happen to be interested in, in creating a model for Runway. Um, creating a run, uh, model for Runway does not necessarily mean publishing it on Runway Store. The idea of creating models means that it just you can you can get runway to admin to sort of deliver or administer the model for you. You can use their cloud service to run it. Um, so if you want to make like a convenient sort of interface for accessing that model, you can make a private runway model out of it. It doesn't have to go in the store, um, but but you can also publish it to the store if you want. Um, so I'm I'm not gonna look at that menu for now. Right now we're just gonna look at a few basic models and kind of see them at work and then we'll try to get them inside of processing as well. And that'll be kind of a, a good way to, to, um, yeah, to, to use our time. Uh, okay, so let's, let's do a, so first of all, like here in this browse model screen, you'll see that there's tons of models, they're broken down into categories. So, you know, if you wanna look at the recognition models, you can click on recognition, it'll, it'll scroll down to a set of highlighted featured models for recognition. There's also this tab between all models and featured. And featured is what you expect. It's just like sort of the, you know, the high, the prized, the most interesting ones that are that are used a lot. And um, all models, you'll see that there's, this is, there's, um, I don't know how many there are, new and popular? Wait, I don't quite understand if it's all models. New. Sometimes I also don't understand some of the, Oh, that's neat. You can make a GIF for the for the header. 
Yeah, there's the, there's a bunch of new ones, which is pretty cool. Oh, no, that's not new. I made that a few months ago. Okay, so <laughs> fine. Um, but we'll go to the featured for now. We'll kind of browse among the featured because the featured ones are all really robust. And um, if you see update complete, you can actually go and just relaunch. So we're up to 0 0.97. I'm going to relaunch. Sometimes the break, uh, the updates break the old old runway versions, so you have to kind of be careful. If you see an error, just make sure you're you're on the latest version. Okay, I'm at zero point nine point seven. Uh, by the way, you can always give feedback to the team by clicking this little like uh, thought bubble over here in the top right, and then uh, writing something to the runway team. The team typically re replies in two days. Not too bad. Um, they're all nice people, all former ITP students, um, so so you might even know them. Okay, so let's look at one of the examples. I'm going to go to the recognition tab, and I'm going to open. Um, where is my uh, mobile net? Oh, where do we put mobile net? Actually, maybe um, post processing workflow style. Where's mobile net? What is it? I don't have that, that bar that you have. Which bar? The, where you generate the motion community is expected. I don't have that. Are you in the featured tab? Featured and yeah. what do you see? I just see, I mean, everything below that looks the same. Like, image generation, I can keep scrolling. Scroll all the way up. Or... Scroll up. Can you scroll up? I have. Yeah, I don't. Maybe it's because I'm on the window or something. It says I'm on the window. I don't have the internet. I just scroll down to Yeah. You can also search for it. So if you go to the search here, search for mobile net. This picture of a dog. So when you see that, click add to workspace and um, it might ask you to either create a new workspace or it'll just put it into a default one um, you can create an, a new workspace if you haven't already it gives you a suggestion for a clever name for that workspace but you can change it if you wish and you should get something that looks like this Everyone sees this? Mm -hmm. Anybody having troubles finding it? Okay. So uh, the the interface is pretty simple for the most part, like for for most of the simple models. So um, at the top, you have an in. The the idea is this: you have some input, you have a model, and you have an output. The mo this model, MobileNet, is a simple image classification model. It takes in some image and it gives us a classification. So in the um, input source here, as it's called, we have just two options. We can either use a camera, in the input we can either use camera or file. So you'll see there's a drop down menu that has them both. And they're also quick button uh, here at the top row. Uh, these are just the same if you, so a uh, file would let you pick a video or an image um, to run it on or camera will just grab your your camera All right so I'm going to use the camera so I'll click on the camera so the camera here is open and then for the output we're just going to use preview preview is going to show us uh, it's just going to show the results in the runway main screen and then here if you look at the options on the side there's a whole bunch of options that let us control certain aspects of this. So for example, the, I actually don't know what the alpha is doing. Controls the width of the network. Um, oh, okay. So you can actually, trading accuracy for performance. So uh, there's, okay, these different alpha parameters, this accuracy versus, versus performance parameter. 
we'll, we'll leave it at 0.75 and then you can also make the camera bigger there's nothing there's no need to change any of these if you want to change like you can change the hue of the camera for example no 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 uh, this is trained already there's no training um, you can blur it also oh that's a lot of blur Um, and then if you look on advanced options, we can look at those really quickly as well. That lets you go, okay, are you going to run this locally or are you going to run it uh, remotely? And you actually can't run this one remotely for a simple reason that you don't need to. This runs perfectly on every computer. So um, you can hide those options. And then once you're ready, just click run locally. It'll take a second to start up. And once it's running, it'll start to give us classifications. So, television system, makes sense, right? Monitor, television, screen, CRT, you see those at the top. It gives you a, a JSON string, and in the JSON string there's one field under the key results, and then that contains, uh, I think it gives you, it looks like five, the top five guesses. And the top five guesses, it, it's an array of um, what do you call it dicts dictionaries which has uh, a class name and the probability right and, you know the probability may be kind of low if you get a high probability that means it's fairly confident um, you can see that it thinks it's a television cash machines I put my phone in front of it maybe it'll think it's a phone iPod 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 um, maybe Microphone. Polaroid camera. If you give it weird things it may not, you know, that may not recognize, then that's kind of a fun thing to do. But this is MobileNet. Now it's giving you a, pr a set of probabilities for all of the different 1,000 categories. And, and the preview is set to just display, return and display five. But you can change that. Um, I thought you could change it, but actually here it doesn't give you that option. It's not a not a parameter. It just gives you the top five. What do you get? Flowers? Kimono. Kimono. Oh yeah, that makes sense. It's kimono esque. Um, so uh, I don't know how fast it's running for you guys. For me, it's like roughly ten frames per second. So it's pretty pretty quick. Yeah, is it w working for everybody? What kind of speeds are people getting? 100 milliseconds, roughly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have a slower computer. Um, the mobile net example. This is actually under the hood. It's the same as the mobile net example in ML5 that we did last week. So it's actually just running JavaScript. That's why it's running locally. Now, uh, one question you may have is like, okay, what do we do with this? How can we make use of this data, right? It's just, it's just inside of Runway. So that's something we'll look at a little bit later today. I'm gonna, I'll show you some examples of getting into processing. For now, I just wanna show you a few more models and then we'll, and then we'll look at the processing bridge. Um, okay, and that, that, will link, that will contain network stuff. So I'm gonna stop this and I wanna go back to the models and you see in the left bar here, you'll see models. You can just click into the models and go back to that screen you came from. Now I'm going to go into recognition. I'm going to go click into Coco SSD. So one thing that's kind of useful to know inside of Runway is that you can, um, you can get information about the models. They have sort of a home screen. So here we can get a, 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 um, a um, description of it. There's also um, a gallery that might have some pictures that show what it does. Um, there's also license. So in case you're thinking about using it for something, you need to check the license terms. And then under settings, um, you can, there's, there's not too many settings. You can kind of just rename the model for yourself if you want to. And um, also, um, if you go on the sidebar on the right, yeah. 
Is that true for everybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe, maybe uh, it might be a permissions thing. Maybe I have those things because I'm on the runway team and this is by runway. Um, my account, it's possible that you wouldn't, yeah, maybe that's why you can't rename it. So don't worry about settings. Not, not for now. Uh, was there another question? Oh. Um, okay. So yeah, forget that part. Yeah. Um, then in, um, okay, so, so I'm going to add this to runway demos and actually I already have it here. So I'm going to go back to it here and now I'm going to run it again and actually, okay. So now there's a few more options, right? I'm going to pick camera again and the preview. You may not already have an image here. This is from last week, I guess. Um, there's three different base models to use. There's MobileNet V1, Mobile. Uh, the, 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 by the way, on the right side, you get options. So some models will come with options. So you might be able to pick a different checkpoint, like pick a different model. Um, and, and for example, here, it gives you, it exposes a parameter of how many things do you want to detect. That's the maxnum max num, uh, boxes. So you can see the this this frozen image is from last week. You can see I got a haircut recently. Um, I'm gonna change this to actually just be like five boxes, so not to overload my screen. And um, I think the order of this is that MobileNet V2 is better than MobileNet V1, uh, and then Light MobileNet V2 is is like the is the uh, light version of it, and that's important because. Um, you might have a situation where you prefer the light version because it's faster or, or that, it that it's smaller so it's downloading it is easier but we'll just go with MobileNet V2 and the camera we can set to if you ever ch want to change the camera you can change it here and the rest is just the, again like the you know different image um, things that you can do and now also if you click on advanced options You'll see, um, oh, Coco SSD is also ML5. So here it's still um, only JavaScript version, so you can just run locally. Okay, so now it's starting up. Look, there's multiple people. Person, person, person. <coughs> Cell phone. <laughs> yeah, who's got the funniest? We should have a competition. Who can get the funniest? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see people just like waving their stuff in front of the cameras. You can mess with it a little bit, like try to cover the camera. Oh. 
Oh, so there's a bug in runway that the camera doesn't doesn't turn off until you turn off runway. It's a bug. They have to fix that. Yeah. Uh, it'll be fine if you open another model and just grab the camera, but Runway doesn't relinquish control of your camera until you close it. Um, that's uh, that needs to be fixed. Oh yeah. It may not have a category for them. Yeah. Okay, so now what I want to do, I want to show you a few more features. I want to show you a model that does use the GPU so that we can look at the external storage. So I'm going to go back to the models view and I'm going to look up something called dense cap. So if you search for dense cap, or just dense, you'll see that there's a model that comes up called dense cap, generate sequence descriptions of regions in an image. You'll see some very familiar person maybe right next to them. Yeah. Who could that be? Um, and click into that and you'll see this. And uh, one thing that's where I forgot to mention that I if you look at the sidebar here, it'll say a bunch of stuff like when was it created, um, what's its size, all this kind of stuff. And then also um, there's information about the, uh, original links for it. So uh, where's the GitHub repository, the paper, the official repository, um, and then you can add other stuff if you, or you might not have that. but. Uh, but okay, so like for example, if you go to the GitHub repository, you'll it'll take you to the imp my implementation. Actually, now it's Anastasis. I think he forked it from mine, but okay. Um, yeah, this this basically has a the implementation, the runway model on GitHub. So if you want to look at the code, you can get it there, and the actual paper you can click in as well. In case you're interested, this is the paper that shows what dense captioning is, describes it in great detail. Dense captioning kind of goes back to 2016, 2015. Um, so if you're interested in any particular model, most of them should be linked to a paper and a, pa uh, pa a, paper and a publication. So that's just all stuff that, that you may want to know. So if you go to add workspace, runway demos, I already have this, so I'm just going to go back to my original. So if you go to dense cap, uh, by the way, make sure that nothing is running. So yeah, this should, I already closed it, so it's not running. And inside of dense cap, again, we'll choose the camera, preview pane, and then just click. And now you'll see that it may be as a default option run remotely. So if you click on advanced options, advanced options basically tells you, do, uh, do you use the, uh, it's mostly which, uh, do you use external, um, sorry, do you, do you use a GPU or a CPU? Do you run it locally or externally? And in the run location remote, you'll see that for, uh, I don't have local as an option. Um, the reason why I don't have local as an option is because to run any model, uh, to run any non-JavaScript model um, on, locally in your computer, you need to have Docker installed. So Docker, <coughs> is an application that basically lets you build virtual machines that that um, that um, sort of surround a um, particular code base that you want to make available and uh, because these models all take a lot of energy and, and and requirements and difficulty to kind of install then it's better to instead of providing instructions for that it's better to just provide a model no sorry like a docker container which is basically like a virtual machine that you can download that, that runs the model. Now, um, problem with Docker, uh, it doesn't really work on Windows, at least not on Windows Home. It doesn't look like there's anybody on Windows here, no? Is there anybody on Windows? One person? Two people? Okay. So uh, this, again, like, run, now we're not going to run the models locally, so this isn't a big deal. But in general, if you ever want to run these locally, you do need Docker, and Docker is a pain to get started, get running on Windows. Um, in any case, um, 
that will let you run locally. Now, if you want to run locally, that means that you're using your own computer for the processing, which is good for two reasons. One is that you don't have to pay for it because it's all on your computer. Um, and then also you don't, um, you, uh, you have a lower latency because there's no server client communications, right? Um, so that's just something to consider. Most computers here can't do anything uh, with the GPU anyway, and so it just makes sense to use a cloud service. But, um, but yeah, that's just something to consider. Now what's going on if you, if you have remote selected is that you can, um, uh, is that you can run remotely. And what run remotely means that instead of running the, the model on your own computer, what it does is it'll take your camera image, it'll send it to Runway um, so that Chris can look at it. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so it'll send it to Runway and it'll send it to Runway servers, like to their cloud service. And it'll do the do whatever it is that you know the model is doing. In this case, it's dense cap, and it'll send you back the results. And so it already implements this whole seamless connection between the cloud and uh, the runway uh, client. So and you don't see any of it. So that's really awesome. That it's actually uh, took a huge implementation to make that work. It's a big convenience. Um, you can run installations remotely this way, right? So now you don't need. You don't need a local GPU. You can just install Runway, and you can use Runway uh, and the cloud to run an installation this way, which is kind of a really nice, nice thing. Um, and um, with the cost of some, some latency, some network latency, which isn't, which isn't too bad, you know, depending on what your restrictions are. So let's, uh, yeah. What is latency? Latency. Uh, it's like the delay in um, the sending the signal. So you send this image and then you have to wait for it to get back from the internet. And so that introduces a, a small delay, um, which may be too, not, you know, too, too large for some, some applications. Okay, so let's run this remotely and see what it gives us. So what it gives you, again, it gives you an array, and each element in the array is a dictionary, which contains three elements, a class, a score, and a B box. B box stands for bounding box. It's a rectangle, x, y, width, and height. Or actually, maybe it's x1, y1, x2, y2, I forgot. Um, you, you can figure that out, because um, I forgot. <laughs> and then class is the class um, actually um, class is a misnomer I, I should fix that uh, it's not a class I don't know why I wrote class it should be like description um, because this is actually giving you a a caption which is a full sentence like a natural language um, sentence describing what's inside the bounding box B box um, and then there's also a score which is basically a confidence value so okay, like like if we look at the first one, the man is smiling. The man is wearing a black shirt. Most of them are variety of that. Man is wearing a black uh, gray shirt, blue shirt, and so on. So um, so that's pretty cool. It gives you a sentence that describes each caption. So maybe if I. man's hand is white, the man is holding a piece of toilet paper, something like that. Um, how about... The people are sitting in the photo. A bottle of water. A woman is sitting. The laptop is black. Woman is wearing a blue shirt. Okay, that's she sure it is. Uh, 
Um, okay, well, that's that's pretty cool, right? Now, um, so that's what dense caption gives you. It's kind of the same as Coco SSD. Uh, wait a second, uh, we did Coco SSD. Yeah, right. It's kind of the same as Coco SSD, except it gives you sentences instead of instead of um, you know classes. So I think I stopped this. Um, I want to show you one more that's in the same variety, um, which would which will be this is dense cap. Um, so you could look at these pretty quickly. Like if you go to face recognition, for example, this uses Dlib, I think, and so you can add this. And here, um, oh yeah, this this actually require like this. You, I don't think it requires it, but if you just do camera and preview and then run remotely, this will detect the face. And I, and here the second input source lets you detect the lets you put in an image of a specific face you want to look for. So if you're looking for a particular face, um, that would be how you do it. I don't think it's required. If you don't, if it's not required, then it'll just give you the first face that it finds. Uh, but maybe it's required. Let's see in a second if it isn't. Okay, having an error. Maybe it does require it. So okay, like if I maybe if I put in label image. So like if I get a file and then I'll go to Let's see if this works. Um, there we go. It's finding a box. Match found. Right. So, so if someone else came in here with me, it would probably it would not detect them, right? Because it's just looking for my face. So it's kind of a way of looking for a person in a crowd. By the way, I'll I'll. Again, I'll show you how to get all of this into processing. I'll show you one or two more models, and then we'll show how to get this and stuff inside of processing. Um, so okay, so that's a nice little face tracker. Now you have face trackers in processing; it's not a big deal. Um, actually, I don't know if there's a face tracker in processing that lets you identify a specific face. That might be something that you don't have um, in processing. I don't think you do. So we'll stop that and then um, go back to models. You see how quickly it is to get a model running. Um, one other thing I wanted to show you is, let's see here, the dense phase alignment. Um, this gives you the actual face landmarks, not just the bounding box surface, but actual landmarks. Um, okay, let's check this out. Let's look at Yolact. So YOLAC does semantic segmentation. So what that means is it looks for objects that it finds and then it segments them out of the image. It gives you a, um, like a mask for each of them. So for example, for this, it'll look for person. Uh, it'll probably find person as soon as it's running. Um, which it seems to be running, but maybe There we go. So it just sees a person right now. See, I'm tinted blue. Cell phone. So it does actual segmentation. Um, and it gives back the segment uh, segmentation as like a, as an image, and so you can use it as a mask pretty easily. So let me see if there's maybe one or two more models that I want to show uh, before showing and processing. Yeah. So um, on mine, like next to camera, defaulting to six hundred by four hundred, and then my camera has high resolution. Yeah. Um, I assume there's 
trade off like a thing with dungeon and slower than a large bit starting. But maybe more accurate in terms of the data that works with how do you um, it, it might it might be I, I don't know if uh, no at a certain point the image gets downsampled before it goes into the camera so it may not be that big of a difference okay. yeah so you may want to do smaller but I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering how to, how to make that trade off like if, if I notice that it's not working well, um, yeah I don't have a generic answer for that I think I think you just have to experiment and see because it probably also depends on the the um, subject matter. So, like you know, some things are easier to find than other things. So it depends on what it is that you're putting in front of. Yeah, but I don't think you have a ton to gain by making it very high resolution. I don't think that that will help. Yeah, I I think you're bound to get that no matter what. Yeah, because it, it down samples it anyway. Yeah. Is there another hand? No. Okay. Um, be, let me just see. Okay, so there's. So over the next few weeks, I'll be showing you some of these. Like at some point, we'll look at the GAN implementations. Right now, maybe I want to. Um, oh, I want to look at one more, which is IM to text. Let's look up IM to TXT. If you search for IM to TXT, you'll see that this. Uh, basically does captioning of images so it's kind of like a dense cap except it just captions the entire image rather than regions of it so if I add it to the runway demos and run remotely um, by the way um, oh and then change this to camera um, the uh, what was a Say I forgot. Uh, oh yeah, um, I was gonna mention that the. Um, well, okay, I'll, I'll mention it after this. So we'll talk about Chainer. Um, okay, so a man holding a Nintendo Wii game controller. It really, uh, I am sex loves Wiis. Um, I don't know why. Man is holding a remote control in his hand. Maybe. Man is holding a cell phone in his hand. Group of people sitting around a table with laptops. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take a bow, neural network. Yeah, star. Um, so okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, now, now this is a good segue into the question of how to get this stuff into environments that we care about. And it just so happens that I picked one for which we already have an example, so we can download it. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that in a second. Um, let me just think if there's any other things that I wanted to mention before we get to that um, about the models. Yeah, we'll, we'll show different models throughout these days. Like when we do a GAN chapter, I'll show you this, the, the GAN implementations inside of Runway. But you've basically seen most of the core Runway features already, believe it or not. Um, the main thing now is how to integrate Runway into some other practice that you're doing. So there's kind of two things that we can do. One is that we can, um, you know, we can basically send this stuff in real time to another environment. Another thing you can do is do an export. So for example, if I click on, instead of preview, I'll click on export. And then it goes, okay, here we decide we want a text file. A CSV, you could use JSON instead if you want. We'll give it a name, whatever, we'll just use the, the, the same name, I'm text September, and I'll put it on the desktop. And then click export. And what it should do is it should start running these uh, through a file. So a man holding a Nintendo Wii game controller. Put it man with a cell phone in his hand blah 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 and so now what I should be able to do is stop this and now file saved so now if I go to my desktop um, here it is 
So you have a CSV file. You could do JSON instead. And it gives you the timestamp and the caption. So straightforward, right? Pretty straightforward. Do an export. You could do an export of a movie clip instead of like a... So now if, if I... Um, so like let's let's say like you know two and what I'll do now is I'll click file and we'll let's put in a movie um, or like an image let's say um, oh let's <laughs> let's do this actually this will be funny so here's this is something I made with again earlier. Let's see what it thinks of it. <laughs> so now, uh, how does this work? So basically, run play and export. A group of, si a pair of scissors sitting on top of a table, a bathroom with a sink and mirror. A woman standing in front of a with a toothbrush. A group of ties hanging in the room. A close-up of a person wearing a tie. Close-up of a pair of scissors on the table. A pair of scissors sitting. A lot of scissors. Black and white photo of a cat, I think. A couple of animals that are laying down. It's kind of like, um, you know those, like, what do you call them? Warsher diagrams? Warsher. Yeah. Warsher. Warsher? Rusher diagrams, yeah. Oh, there's a person, right? A woman in a dress, shirt, and a tie. Perfect. Now it's a man. So, um, yeah, it's like one of those you have to interpret it, and then you're you're kind of like uh, psychologically profiled based on how you what you say this blob looks like. So this is the machine equivalent of that. So I get the sense you're gonna get this, but just in case, like what. Can you give an example of what you can do with a text file that has that stuff? I just assume that like, if you're building some new process and you want to be able to have it be interactive and have the model running, so that you can you know, interact with the model in real time. But just, I guess that's not always the case. What do you do with that text file? Well, um, let's say you, like, like um, I mean, it's hard to say for me because it's very specific to the application. So like maybe you're analyzing a movie mm -hmm. and you want that movie to drive some visuals, but maybe you don't need it to be interactive. Mm -hmm. Like here it's simply, uh, you know, something that you can do offline. So you generate a text file and then you can load that text file into Max or whatever environment that you have. Um, you can also do it in real time. You can push those results to, to Max in real time. We'll kind of show how to do that in processing at least. Um, so, so in that sense, yeah, you, you, um, this just gives you the option to do stuff like in a way that produces the output. Right. So here you can see that we analyze this movie. So that's cool, right? Um, okay, so let's do this now. Now I want to show you how to get this into processing. And um, I'll go back to the preview pane. So here's the idea. Um, it's doing these classifications. Still working, right? Yeah. So if you click on the network tab, you'll see that it shows info, info for um, a bunch of network protocols for how it both takes uh, accepts input and uh, produces output. We'll look at the outputs first. So in there's a few ways of interfacing with it over the network. HTTP, socket, WebSocket, uh, OSC, and JavaScript. Um, so these are all, uh, and JavaScript I think just uses WebSocket if I'm not mistaken. Um, basically, you can get this information sent real time using all of these protocols. Um, I'm going to show you how to get it inside of processing, and the best way to do it with processing is to use the OSC protocol. 
So if you click on the OSC tab, then um, you'll see that it gives you the address. So this is the, the OSC server, this is the input, this is where, uh, uh, yeah, it's the input, and then basically this is what it produces. It'll produce a caption. So what I'm gonna do is, they're in, in, the run, in Runway's GitHub, Runway has a repository, github.com slash runwayml slash processing. Feel free to grab this if, you're, if you want to follow along the processing examples. Remember this is being recorded, so don't, don't worry too much about it. You'll, you'll have the ability to, to go back to it. But I click on, uh, I'm going to download it. I'm just simply going to download it. Put it into here. Already have it. It's, these are just processing, processing uh, programs. Yeah. So if you click on this, and you go to here, you'll see that it has a few examples already. And one of the ones that it already comes with is IAMP text, which is the one that we happen to have loaded. So I'm going to click, I'm going to open this with processing. And if you're doing this for the first time, if, you're, if you haven't used processing, you do need to have the OSC P5 library. So if you haven't already done that and you're using this, you can, um, anybody know if there's gonna be a, a processing four anytime? Still working on that, we should ask Dan. Kind of curious. Um, hmm. New sound library. So um, here's what I'll do now. I'm going to, so you would have to go to sketch, import library, add, and if you don't have OSCP5, you would go to add library, and then just search for OSCP5, and then you need to just have this installed. You would just click install, and so then, then you will have um, the OSC library. Otherwise, everything is, is peachy. Okay, so check this out. If I go ahead and run this, while this is running, a man with a beard is holding a laptop, whatever. If I run this, it's going to send the captions onward to processing. Okay, now this example is not terribly exciting. All it's doing is it's copying the caption but the point is that now you have the, the processing receiving a real-time feed of what's inside the camera, and then you have everything that you have with processing you have, you have now, right? So maybe, so I can tell you some different things that, that students of mine have done as creative projects with IMS text. The, my favorite one of all time is uh, we had a group, uh, my collaborator Andreas and I had a group at CIID, and one of them used Runway and IMS text just as you see. And they made they, they designed a game in which teams would have to compete in order to get a certain caption out of I'm text. It was like reverse Pictionary. So like if if it got a man with a beard is holding a laptop, then they would have to scramble in front of the camera to try to get the computer to say a man with a beard is holding a laptop, something like that. And then two the teams would compete with each other to see who would do it first. Um, so, so that's a that's a great example. That would be like a really something like that would be an awesome midterm idea, right? Um, so, uh, so first of all, like what's going on here? You could you could read the processing code. It's pretty straightforward. It goes okay. Open up, um, open up the following. Uh, you know, make make the following processing OSC listener. That's listening on port 57200. Um, and uh, connect to it and then, and then draw captions, which is if there's, if there's data, just produce it here. And you can see that the OSC message that it receives right here, it just goes parse data string. So it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. It's a really small amount of code not including comments there's just like 50 lines of code something like that so it's pretty it's oh there's a lot less actually there's probably just like 30 lines of code it's a lot of comments 
Um, so that's something that, that you can look at later if you want to look at it more carefully. The code is pretty self-explanatory. Again, if you, if you feel comfortable with processing. I mean, people are using processing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that may be that may be of use to you. Um, again, processing is one of the environments you can consider doing this. You get this into open frameworks as well. Um, I don't know if there's open. No one's using open frameworks here, right? I guess not really. Oh, you are. Okay. Well, you may want to use open frameworks if you wish. Um, fair enough. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, let's look at some of the other processing examples real quick. So I'll stop this model. And you see that, th now first of all, it, does, it, it just comes with a few, uh, oh no, really? Oh, I know why, oh, I know why, because I, I bet it never cleared the, hold on a second. <laughs> 